Yeah, sure. So um, firstly, thank you. Thank you for having me on the um, Global Azure Virtual Bootcamp. This is um, really exciting to be a part of, so thank you. Um, yeah, this session is, I'll be totally honest with you, this is not the polished content I maybe normally share. Um, this is very much something that is a work in progress and I'm still working on this. So actually, I'm super happy to take questions really whenever. Um, also going to be sharing sort of a bit of a story some tooling and then also um, maybe some warnings let's call them warnings um, around uh, when you approach these types of projects and um, some of the stuff we hear when we speak to customers so yeah th this one is specifically around uh, a project that i've been working on around love island data so let me let me start with a bit of a story let me take you back to a nice time. <laughs> June 2019, um, the sun was out, sort of, I think, and uh, Love Island on ITV2 is a TV show uh, in the UK that happens. It's very, very popular where a lot of um, <laughs> uh, single people go on, go, they get to go to Mallorca, they still stay in this fabulous villa, and it's a game show to couple up and uh, you could win £50,000 at the end. There's many trials and tribulations um, that happen to these singletons. They have to do a lot of tasks and stuff like that. Um, but it also became a bit of a sensation in the UK. Um, my social media was going mad. It was something that was like a dedicated do not contact me between 9 and 10 p.m. <laughs> any, any weekday. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was fantastic. And there was a lot of... Um, its own vocabulary that Love Island made. So things like I've got a text or grafting or laying it on factor 50 were just some of the um, phrases that became very, very popular and also um, very good for kind of memes and gifs. But one of the things that I was actually able to do was whilst I was watching Love Island, keeping the um, keeping a track of all the things that were happening. So I'd been a fan for some of the previous series, but in 2019, I told myself that, um, actually, I think I was speaking to like a student group or like a graduate group, and I was speaking to them about data science. And I kind of wanted to say like, like everything produces data now. It doesn't just have to be financials, insurance, healthcare, like it, it's actually anything. And in the entertainment sector, this is becoming more, um, relevant than ever in some senses. And so one of the interesting things here was I kind of immediately just kept uh, a note. It was literally on my phone whilst I was sitting on the sofa. And I'll show you my uh, very advanced technology for that. And um, just keeping a track of like what was happening and also keep trying to collect historical data about the competition. And basically, I created this blog. So if you go to uh, bit.ly slash Love Island dash blog, um, you can get to this blog. Um, I understand, obviously, given this is the sort of Azure bootcamp, not everyone here um, might deem themselves a data scientist or a data analytics expert. So we just want to steady the nerves. Actually, there's a lot of interest in just around the scenario um, and how we approach it. So I won't dive too deep into some of the stuff that we did, but um, definitely want to kind of explain how I got to where I did. So first things first, uh, this blog post, it sits on Medium. Um, <clears throat> posted just at the end of June, so as the competition was kind of uh, sort of a few weeks in. This is kind of a very, one of the things that I don't do is I don't actually tend to post a lot of um, uh, work stuff on, say, my, my personal social media. But this one, this one went everywhere. Uh, my friends and family were interested, people at work were interested. Um, and so it just shows that actually when you start to analyse data and it tells a story, that actually that is the most interesting part of it in some senses. And everyone should be able to understand the output you should be able to tie it to something that happens in the real world, I always believe. Um, but to kind of kick us off, I had I found four findings that I thought were quite interesting. So finding number one, um, if you are a part of the first set of people that enter this villa in Love Island, you're actually much more likely to win. And this is given sort of three and actually now four years worth of historical data. Um, it was really very simple to just kind of get, okay, 
who entered, what day they entered, um, when they left, how long they were in couples, all of this kind of data. But actually, when you started to plot it, really obvious patterns came out. So uh, great thing, 100% correct for all winners for the past three years. Um, and it was, I think it very slightly uh, drops for the fourth year where the, uh, the girl in the couple was part of the first group, but the gentleman was not. Uh, finding number two, most winners of Love Island in the UK have actually come from the south of the UK. Now, someone on my team from the US actually said, well, isn't the south of the UK bigger than the north of the UK or the Midlands? And I was like, hmm, I'm not actually sure. So that was one thing that I needed to check out. But 83% of winning couples were from the south of the UK for the previous three years. And actually, if we very quickly just potted on I know people, some people don't like pie charts, so I can only apologise. But for this, it kind of works quite well. Um, in, the, in 2016, 17 and 18, actually, the majority of contestants, 60 percent of them were from the south, um, whereas in 2019, they tended to do a bit more of a split. So the south was still the majority, but only just from the north being at 33 percent of people as well. So it was super interesting to just see the changes in both the programme um, maybe the awareness of it, who wants to contribute to it. Maybe we're, if we see all the same people, we kind of want to see something a bit different. So this is kind of an interesting finding. Um, finding number three, couples who win the competition tend to be together for the majority of the show. So the average length of the couple, the winning couple was actually 41 days. They were probably together from pretty much the start to the end. Um, there was a really weird finding uh, that the third place seemed to be together longer than the second place. Couldn't really suss out um, within the data why that might have been. Um, but I guess it was kind of one of these obvious ones. Well, if they're together, the public buys into them a little bit more. You feel like you get to know them um, as a couple and therefore you probably vote for them. And then finally, finding number four was a really interesting one. I was really uh, fascinated to know what all these people did before they entered the villa, because afterwards they all become kind of like Instagram influencers. But for now, like what were they doing before? And so it's super interesting to kind of plot just a very, very simple word cloud that would tell us what kind of the winners did. And one of the things that I found was actually they tend to be in quite customer facing jobs if they do well. Um, I'm sure we're all in that position, some of us, uh, where we do interact with people. Um, and actually, there's a lot to be said about a conversation when you build that. And if you um, can kind of connect with people, people often buy into you. And it was exactly the same here. So people who were performers, hairdressers, um say people in sales or people who were managers maybe they needed to do more like convincing um and so found it maybe a bit easier to win over the the british public so lots and lots of interesting um data that we're able to get but one of the things i actually wanted to show you was uh this blog post which kind of connects from the original one and this one actually got a lot more traction, um, a lot more claps on medium uh, than the sort of general findings one. But this one was like the how of how I did it. And to be totally honest with you, it was fairly basic. Um, a lot of people kind of dive into data problems and immediately jump to, OK, I'm going to predict the winner or I'm going to predict this. or I'm going to predict that machine learning has, has taken us all over and we kind of want to try it out. And, and that's really good. But all of these findings came from simple data analysis. And I just found it so interesting that actually I always see this as the first step in any data science project that I do. You must dive into that data and totally understand what's going on, what correlates, what doesn't, um, and start finding some patterns potentially before you start asking uh, more in-depth or uh, sort of future looking questions. So I very quickly just wanted to show you the very basic side of gathering this data. This data um, was put together by me <laughs> um, and just kind of off, off my back. So it's a little bit manual, but um, actually things like Wikipedia do a really, really good job of just um, keeping a track of everything that happens. So for historical data, it was very easy to just get each series and in each series, they had this really handy table 
um, where it basically told you some of the information, uh, some of the basic information that I wanted to know. Um, but then I also popped that all into who doesn't love Excel? I don't know why we all pretend we don't. We do. Um, Excel actually was perfect for this kind of thing. Um, just very, very basic uh, storage. I was actually, I mentioned to you, like I was tracking this as it was happening. And so what I did was I literally had Excel, the app on my iPhone. Uh, I would sit on the sofa and as things would happen, so someone went on a date or someone joined the villa or they changed couples or um, they won a, one of the competitions or the challenges, I just basically add that data in. It's a super manual, I'll be honest. Um, could I have collected more data? Yes. Could there be really cool ways that you could automate it? Absolutely. But to first check that there was any kind of pattern there or anything of interest, I kind of dove in um, with just very, very basic technology. Um, and then the key thing was to actually just start exploring the data. Um, for that, at the time, I used Azure Notebooks, which is a um, a form of Jupyter that sits on Azure. And you can go to notebooks.azure.com, uh, sign in with your Azure account, and then just use all of this within a web browser. It's very, very popular in data science and the Jupyter tool specifically. And I actually wanted to show you more recently, I've kind of collated everything into one space, and that's inside a tool called Azure Machine Learning. Um, it looks a bit like this in the portal. Um, you, As with any Azure service, uh, you go to create a new resource, type in machine learning, you'll see this little sort of uh, graphical canonical glass come up. Uh, you fill in some basic information about where you want this, what resource group, etc., and it will create the whole infrastructure behind the ability for you to run machine learning and data analysis problems. Azure Machine Learning has something called a studio. The studio is where I spend most of my time, to be honest with you. Um, the I see the Azure portal piece as kind of like the infrastructure, the setup, maybe when you look at things like access control, who can do what with what resources, um, and, and maybe things like locks if you don't want it to be deleted, for example. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to mention as well was with Azure Machine Learning to just use the Jupyter experience or the notebooks kind of experience. You actually don't need to have the enterprise edition. You can just use sort of the basic edition. Um, enterprise means using some of our, our services. So things like automated machine learning or the Azure Machine Learning Designer tool. So the click and drag kind of GUI way of building machine learning models. So um, just to keep that in mind, you actually don't always need to have the new enterprise edition. If I open the studio, in the studio, it kind of looks a little bit like this. So this is where I live. Um, and if I go into my compute tab, I created uh, basically what is a virtual machine in some senses in Azure. That's how I think about it. But one of the really nice things for someone who's into data analytics is it comes with loads of pre-installed tools. So instead of me doing sort of that ARM template and having sort of a basic data science machine in Azure um, that has to be like managed and stuff like this, all of that is dealt for me with me for me here. And it's super easy to create as well. You literally just need to put in at, at the bare minimum two different fields. And so it was very much designed for the data scientists, maybe rather than sort of a, a cloud architect or uh, an infrastructure type person. So that was kind of, I believe, the thinking behind it. Say if I clicked on this Jupyter uh, link here, it actually opens up my dev machine, Amy Dev, um, in West Europe. So that we can see that again, it's just a virtual machine behind the scenes, but then it has Jupyter, this popular data science tool, kind of already running, and I can just use sort of the file structure. And what I wanted to show you in this piece was basically some of the basic Python um, and really basic sort of visuals that allowed me to just start to explore the data set. So if you're getting into this space and maybe you're new to Python as well, I highly recommend looking at a package called matplotlib for any data visualizations. Um, they have really good documentation, number one. Um, they have great examples that you can kind of build on. So to be totally honest with you, 
um, who doesn't Google pretty much everything they write. So it was great to be able to go there, take some examples and then build them up in some senses. So here I can import some packages and read in my data. And the nice thing about Jupyter is actually the ability to say, hey, read in this CSV file, which is my Excel file, which is saved as CSV. And then basically just look at the top bit. So I can just look and go, is it is it the right thing that I'm looking at? OK, like what different um, how, what different columns have we got going on and, and stuff like that? And then you can also see the dimensions of the data set by default. So that's always very handy. Um, you can do things like describe the data set and that gives you more sort of um, statistical information about things. So um, the number of days in the villa, what was the medium? The medium was actually about 20 days, whereas uh, the number of couples, um, the average was sort of about one hour. So you'd say basically two um, with a minimum of some people going away with none. And actually someone had six different uh, couples across however long they were in the villa. So it, it can just show you some kind of highs and lows and averages so you can get ahead around your data. Um, I wanted to take a look at the shape of this data and then some of the columns in it. But then I can also do things like just extract, OK, who are the ones that were the winners? I just want to see that all of the winners so that I could just eye up the different data and see whether I could see any sort of uh, person like correlations myself. Uh, you can do the same with runners up and third place. So quite a lot of repetition. But the graphs were the bit that got kind of the most interesting. So plotting something like the age with uh, the average age in a, in a histogram. So it's interesting to see there is quite a young audience um, of people who uh, actually take part in the show with I think the youngest being 18 uh, and the oldest being 31 or 32. Um, but say the, the, uh, the mean or the average being about 23 years old. If you broke that down by year, it kind of looks a bit different. So then it was interesting to plot these against each other. So in 2016, the average being nearer 24, but by 2018, it dropped a, a little bit more um, with the youngest people being in this, the 2017 series, but actually then starting to look more at sort of 1920 um, and then the oldest being at a similar space. So it was interesting to just see kind of the difference. This is called a violin chart. Um, they're not very popular. Um, I'm not really sure why for a spread of data, they're really, really interesting. Um, and a spread of data over different um, sort of time periods, it can really show you a slight change. Like here in 2017, it's interesting to see that there was sort of, yes, there was still the same kind of um, most people in this age range, but it was interesting to see there was some slightly older people compared to 2018 um, and 2016. There's very, very few sort of uh, um, up towards 30 year olds type people. Things like um, days in the villa, it was quite easy to then just say, OK, like people, if you've watched Love Island, might recognise some of these names, um, things like plotting how long they'd been in the villa so some of the longest people these are some of the people that won um to some of the people who didn't get a lot of um time in the villa um but interesting to see like oh do you remember them why would you remember them type thing um and so on and so on so you can see this is where i started to get then some of my um pie chart graphs from and stuff like that and i just continued down the interesting one was um more around scatter plots it was very very interesting to just start extracting columns of my data set and then actually comparing them against each other to see if there was any correlation so the day the contestant joined the villa correlated with the number number of couples they had so if they joined the villa um, on day zero they're more likely to have more couples it's an i think it's an obvious trend this one it was one to just test out that i could Kind of read the graphs correctly and I was understanding the data um, if you arrived sort of on a towards the end of the competition of course you have much less time to get into different couples um, I was interested to know if the age of someone um, dictated how many couples they're in like people might see think that 
um, maybe the younger contestants would kind of be a bit more, you know, um, oh, you know, I'll just couple up with another person, that would be fine. Like maybe they wouldn't feel like they, ha they had to be as committed. And it was interesting to see there wasn't really any correlation um, happening here. Uh, so it was interesting because I'd in my head made that hypothesis that I thought it would. So that's my own, maybe my own bias. Um, so it's interesting to actually see the data for that. And so on and so on. All of this information is on GitHub. So I'll share a link if in case you wanted to dive into it a little bit more. And again, if you wanted to check out um, the blog post, like take a good read. I spent a bit of time. I was so involved in the whole thing at the time that it kind of, I hope the style of it is, um, is kind of into the, the Love Island piece. So those are some of the findings we listed off, basically. So I, I found that the first group to enter the villa was more likely to win. Most winners have come from the south of the UK. Couples who win tend to be together for the, most of the show. And islanders do well in the competition that have customer facing jobs. Um, so I made a bit of a, like a tongue in cheek saying, oh, if you're applying for Love Island, like, hey, maybe like check out this four criteria because these are the people currently that seem to be the most successful. Um, and also it was interesting to see if I go to, I'm a big fan of Power BI. I think they briefly mentioned it in the session before as well. For exploring data, building graphics quickly, um, building graphics that you can present out to people as well so that everyone can understand the outcome. Um, I, I absolutely loved it for this. So I was able to create say, a report for each year of the contestants. Um, even bringing in things like images so we can remember who each one was. And then actually starting to compare some of these different things. So um, each of the years kind of compared to each other, um, maybe looking at the traits of the winner. So having, you know, OK, if I selected just winner, what does that look like? And then being able to say, um, yet yeah, they were all the first to enter the villa, the majority are from the south. Um, the people who were committed for the longest in that in that um, specific year, and then their um, different job roles. So it was not quite nice to then be able to say, hey, like it does show in the visuals automatically. And then also do fun things like this. I need to actually update this. This is on one of my improvement pieces. Um, this was for 2019. This is probably one of my favourite series, actually. Uh, Molly May is my favourite person ever. Um, and it's so interesting to see that this was during the competition and actually being able to say, hey, like the people who are currently most likely to win, given my findings, are X, Y and Z, um, was a little bit less of a this is a pure prediction and a bit more of a guided thing like if we saw the same trend this could be the way that it moves so being quite conscious of the fact that this is not a prediction this is just an historical analytics so yeah big fan of power bi for sharing this information and visuals of people as well as looking at the more um sort of uh, uh, like um data analysis type graphs using python but I was collecting all of this data in an Excel and that was great and really, really interesting. But social media was blowing up like it was just absolutely manic and, and not just Twitter, which I'm showing here. Twitter was very, very popular, um, but Instagram and Facebook and um, I'm sure many, many other different platforms as well that everyone was both Love Island was posting, um, some of the contestants even get to sort of post or the people who look after their accounts whilst they're in there. Um, things like people's comments though. And this was where it kind of took me back a little bit. So, um, oh, sorry. so yeah, one of the things that I immediately thought of was actually, well, if we have all of this Twitter data, then what if I started to analyse people's comments? Um, should that be like fairly easy? And so if you look at something like um, the Azure Cognitive Services, a really nice um, low key way of getting into um, 
into machine learning you can just be a developer you don't really you don't need to know anything that, that's happening behind the scenes you can literally if you can call an api you can use these types of um, ai services and so text analytics is one that does things like key phrases sentiment and more recently has actually broke the document to the full piece of text down into sentences as well so very quickly wanted to show you uh, a quick test that I did of this because I always, always go to our cognitive services first. This is one of my, maybe my, um, my warnings. <laughs> um, I am someone who, who would maybe think about, okay, if I have to do a certain prediction problem, I'll go straight to a machine learning tool. I'll start building it myself. I have really tried quite hard to, to not do that. Um, a lot of these APIs are very, very powerful. Um, they might not always fit your exact need, but they also might be something that supplements what you're doing. So in this case, what I wanted to do was just, OK, if I was to put uh, Twitter data in there, Twitter data has a very specific format. It's quite short. There's no full stops. There's no punctuation. Um, it's, it's got a lot of slang in it, potentially. It's got a lot of hashtags in it. Um, and so I thought, well, actually, I should probably try it. So one of the things that I did was I took a tweet uh, sample one. And if I just literally just go to the website, azure.microsoft.com, cognitive services and text analytics, you can, oops, sorry, you can literally just paste in uh, any sample data. You can obviously also do this by the APIs using things like Postman. And if I click analyze, it will send off my piece of text. I've not signed up for anything. I don't even need to be an Azure customer. Um, and one of the things that we can see is it picks out things like key phrases uh, and it's also uh, split down my sentences. So it says it's this is a mostly negative sentiment tweet, um, but there is a bit of positive in there. And so if we scroll down, we can see that actually the first sentence, so um, unpopular opinion, this one. Michael is still a good guy, but he's confused and is encouraged by the boys. Um, 99% negative. Sentence two is quite positive. What's that? He has every right to speak to the girls. And then sentence three, quite negative, but it's unfair on our Queen Amber. Um, and so it's it's very interesting to see that it broke that down. Now I'm gonna, this was more for demo purposes. This is not the format in which this tweet came. It's Rora's format. I read the tweet and actually broke it down into what seemed like useful sentences. So this, um, there is no punctuation in a tweet. Um, there are no things like, not really things like sentences. And then if you analyze something like that, because it's not say a more structured data, it just says it's 100% negative and there's one sentence and it's negative and the, but it still picks out things like all of those key words. So, this was one of these ones where I suddenly went, well, this isn't going to quite fit for what I potentially want to do. And let's talk a little bit more about what I want to do. So I'm going to take you way back now in this story. And one of the interesting things around this story is in June 2014, I actually did something very, very similar with a very similar demographic of data. So I actually did a lot of my um, computer science research, I focused in on machine learning and my final research was trying to predict the outcome of the X factor given um, the Twitter data. And it was so interesting because it sounds like a super trivial topic and you're like, how did they possibly that, uh, submit that as research? But a lot of work, a lot of very technical work went into this. Um, natural language processing, natural language processing of social media data specifically, um, and then also trying out lots of different algorithms which fit at the time, which fit best with text processing. Also then looking at things like ranking, so different types of how would I rank the contestants um, as to say who I think will win and also who would be let, uh, who would be removed from the competition. So lots and lots of cool stuff happened there. And everyone always says, well, did it work or not? Because it's a bit like, it sounds a bit like betting on the horses. Um, it's it's not, it's much more, um, it, it'd be less real time. Well, it could be more real time now, but it was more historical back then. Um, at the time, it did pretty well. So I had a load of tweets from the competition. I was able to break them down into weeks and sentences. And then one of the things that I was able to do is basically put, um, 
rank these contestants. So when there was less than six X Factor singers, um, I was able to rank them correctly, who would win and who would be removed from the competition that week. Um, I actually used a really, if, if you're into machine learning or you've done anything with natural language processing, I actually use quite a, what we would now deem as a historical approach. And um, support vector machines were the thing, like they were the algorithm for natural language processing at the time. They were the ones that were doing the most with being able to break down sentences. Uh, and things like neural networks was just not something that was going to be used um, in 2014. Now, you, I would, in fact, now I have taken a very different approach, and we'll see that in a minute. And um, I also trained this on domain specific data. So I did use the Twitter and X Factor data only. If this had been trained on something like just pure Twitter data, so just general knowledge, um, it probably wouldn't have worked as well because we were doing sentiment analysis. And I, I do believe that sentiment analysis is very specific to the domain that you're in. So, for example, one of them was in the X Factor, the word music is used a lot. In the context of the X Factor, music is neutral because everything's talking about, well, most things are talking about the music. Whereas in other parts of um, a, a different domain, music might be considered a positive sentiment. And so this is really, really interesting to make that distinction between why training on quite specific data for your domain is sometimes something that needs to be kind of considered. But there was some things I wanted to improve. So one of them was that the I, I made a lot of assumptions. Um, so, for example, the data that I extracted from the Twitter API about X Factor in a certain time period, there was a lot of constraints on this data. And one of them was that it had to have an emoji. So a smiley face, a sad face, a laughing face, etc. Um, and one of these things was I made the assumption that given the emoji in the sentence, I could tag this data with positive, negative or neutral. Um, so if it was a smiley face, it's a positive sen a sentence. If it's a neg if it's a sad face, it's a negative sentence. This is, you could say in most cases, this is likely to be okay. Obviously, this doesn't take into account things like sarcasm. Sarcasm is actually something that's still very hard to solve. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that like this was something that I had to do in order to get automatically labeled data. And that's something in machine learning that's quite um a bit of a blocker sometimes so you might have a load of data but you don't really have a clue what's going on in it um and you to label it all would be really really manual and so this was kind of that happy medium of being able to automatically try and label some data one of the things that came out was i could do a sentence is positive or a sentence is negative but i couldn't extract the why and this bothered me a bit um I could say that someone was being spoken about really positively or someone, unfortunately in the X Factor, some people was spoken about really negatively online um, and we could see the distinction between the two, but I couldn't always at the time pick out, it would have been key phrase extraction, which would have been a whole nother thing, um, but the why. And so that's something I wanted to kind of uh, jump onto. And also I did this in 2014. I ran it on a laptop that's currently sitting down here in my study and it no longer turns on. So we can tell that I literally ran that laptop to death with all of this data. Um, whereas now I would absolutely never do that. I use everything in the cloud. Uh, I use scalable compute, et cetera. And we just have amazing tooling that makes this stuff much more possible. So fast forward, we're in September 2019. So only a few months ago, what, six months ago-ish? And um, Ari Bornstein on my team, so another cloud advocate specializing in AI and machine learning, created an amazing session at Ignite the Tour. If you do want any of the content for those sessions, do check out that GitHub link at the bottom. Um, all of the content, all of the videos, all of the demos are all there for you to take and use. Um, Ari created AIML40 in that repository, and AIML40 was all about um, natural language processing and Azure machine learning. And I was just kind of inspired by something that he found in the space. He is uh, definitely someone to follow if you're into this space. He found something called aspect based sentiment analysis, and so we call it ABSA for short. And ABSA is basically what I see as asking for the what and the why. So what is the sentiment and why is that the case? 
And so one of the interesting things I found was it was great to see for this retail sample retail sales set that we use um, loved the sweater, but hated the pants. Now in the UK, that kind of doesn't make sense. <laughs> Be a bit worrying, but a um, really great outfit. I really like the shirt. So the idea here is that the, the colorful circle surrounds with the with the sentiment the actual word so the the word say shoes there the shoes are bad but the perfect but the blouse is perfect shoes is negative but the actual word is called an aspect and then the negative is called an opinion and these two things are actually sandwiched together and learnt across your data using aspect based sentiment analysis so rather than saying this whole sentence I want to know what it is in the sentence. And you can see how this would be really useful, right, in a, in a context of a business. Um, when you look at reviews, who has ever, like I certainly have never wrote, written a TripAdvisor review, even if I've given it like four stars or something, there's always something in there that you might, would say that you would improve. Um, or maybe you've said everything is really, really positive, but something. It's that but bit that actually is what the, the owner of that company or that hotel or that destination, whatever it is, wants to know because that's what they can improve on. And this is where I, I believe aspect-based sentiment analysis is really, really popular. If you want to find out more, there's a bit.ly link there. Just go to absa-intel. Um, this is created by Intel. This is not created by Microsoft. So I wanted to show you something that was kind of third party. You can use any framework, but you can use the tooling in the cloud to actually help you be more successful. Um, there's a quick way that this trains. It basically brings in the data. It pre-processes your very, very raw data. Now, that is something that's quite interesting. I did a lot of pre-processing in the previous one. Um, and so it's, it's it's super interesting that it can do that pre-processing for you. Um, it extracts from your data. So I don't need to pass it any labels. I no longer have the restriction of having to have something with an emoji and the assumption that the emoji relates to the text. And so this was something that was really interesting. This is actually called unsupervised machine learning compared to supervised machine learning where it has the tag. So when I start to train it, it extracts a load of aspects so a load of um what well, i see them as like nouns or verbs pieces of the sentence that are say like keywords and they will it will say these are abs these are aspects in your data set and then it will have an opinion lexicon that's pre pre-built that they give you in this model and it will re-rank the different opinions based on your data so we we use the, the example of music with the x factor if I use the X Factor data again, music or something about music, if it was positive or negative, might be then just considered neutral. So it trains the model on your data set, no labels, and then you pass in what comes out of it is an opinion lexicon. So a lexicon is a list of words. That's why I think of it. A lexicon, a list of words and a tag. Um, and same with aspect. It's, a, it's breaking down your big CSV file into which bits are actually useful aspects in your data. And then we pass all that back into the model with some new data, and then it will tell us how it classifies it. So that's a, a kind of training and an inference pipeline that we use in something like machine learning. So we use ABSA and um, actually Henk is on the call um, and also um, uh, Ari and lots of our teams built some amazing stuff. So if you go to aka.ms slash AIML40 repo, in fact, I'll type it in the comments now, um, aka.ms oh, uh, slash AIML40 repo, you can actually go and get a load of sample code that can show you how to run this type of model in Azure Machine Learning and all of the instructions that go with it. Really, really amazing stuff, super easy to set up. Now, fast forward to only a month ago in March 2020, I thought, actually, this is exactly what my Love Island problem needs. If I have all of this tweet data sitting in just basic table storage, it's super raw, it's super messy, and I have zero labels to put on it. How can I start to analyze it? What, it, what is the, the aspect is potentially the, the contestant and the uh, label is then kind of what they do like is it positive is it negative and then I could start looking at the ranking piece again 
So, um, so before we go to what's next, let me show you some of this code. So one of the interesting things, um, all of that sample code is here. It's called ABSA. You get this notebook. Um, it's got amazing graphics in that Hank put in. And it's really quite easy to kind of walk through um, and start to understand some of the code. But I also wanted to say I use this as a template to then put in my own um, model using ABSA. So I then call my uh, notebook absa-love island it basically looks exactly the same all i've done is change a few parameters and basically change the data set so i can set up my environment so i have a workspace so in my here we have a workspace this is my full workspace here and inside we have all these different experiments I can connect to remote compute. I told you about my very, very damaged laptop down there from university. Um, that was super interesting to see, right? Because actually, if I can call off to compute that's remote, I no longer need to worry about running it on this actual device. So that's, that's it's perfect for the actual sheer size of some of the problems that you might come, in, uh, come into contact with. And so if I go into my studio and I go to compute and go to compute clusters, You'll see that I have, in fact, one of them is resizing down to zero now after I just ran one. Um, I have two clusters that can be used, the clusters of compute. You'll also see, um, as, a, as Azure people, these are basic um, CPU machines. These are not big, huge GPUs. The Intel, the ABSA model is actually um, optimized to run on CPU instead. This is also a really, really good thing about it. But one of the things I wanted to show you was basically the ability for me to run an experiment, tag it with a load of different things that I'm able to experiment on. So an experiment in machine learning is never a one, what, what I like to call a one hit wonder. It's just not. The first one you run is going to be a nightmare. You don't really understand what the outcome truly means until you start to compare it to other different experiments in machine learning. So, for example, the, I changed the data set multiple times. I changed the amount of validation tests that I had, and I also changed the amount of iterations to the times that it ran through my data. You can send all of this information off to the cloud and then get um, a great sort of like results piece. In fact, the driver logs tend to be much more interesting. This is where you can actually see the, the model running through my 45,000 tweets in that example. Um, and it obviously does that. So this was iteration four. And so it ran it through five different times. And so you can double check, even though it's running in the cloud, you can always check in and see where it is. And then finally, if we go down, you can actually register the model, pass it some interesting new um, Love Island responses, and then get it to actually start tagging your responses. Now, this is one of the things I want to be totally honest with you. This is a work in progress. When I ran this um, only last week, I was getting very, very different results. So I have a, I have a YouTube video here. Uh, I did a bit of a Twitch stream around it. And what you'll notice is I really like this one. It was like, I really hope Amber positive and Michael positive win Love Island. Sorry, Curtis. And so that was negative. I thought it just broke down that sentence perfectly. I've come back and ran it this morning and it's not quite doing the same thing. So this is one of my next improvements to make as to why it's um, changed so drastically. Uh, it could be the model behind the scenes. So maybe I need to choose a version of the Intel model. Interesting when you're th using third party frameworks, always something to remember. But the key is that we can start to experiment. And this is conscious of time. I wanted to show you very quickly one of the things I absolutely love about experimenting in Azure machine learning, it's very, very simple. It's not something that is widely known, but actually this page is my go to for totally understanding what I'm doing. So um, this is basically like my score. So is it any good or not? F1 weighted. Uh, and so it's interesting to see over the different runs of this experiment, I've gradually got it better where actually run number 18 was my highest what we could call some form of accuracy. And then also I can see that the number of different aspects within inside my lexicon is also something that I can track over time. And so you can really see some trends. Also, 
I can do things like tag my experiments. So if we go back down here, we can see that the data set that I used was different in all four of these experiments and then check in the output. I then said, OK, well, the smaller varied seems to be uh, the smaller test one seems to be the most successful. So what I'll do is I'll up the amount of validation. And so I keep one thing consistent, the validation test, and run it against all my data sets again. And same thing, I just keep changing one thing at a time to understand whether my experiment gets better or not. And then finally, if you go into any of these runs, so this one, number 84, this one, uh, is a really, really good example. I can get all of my information on here, but also if I go into my outputs, I can start to see that opinion and aspect lexicon. So they are generated in my output files. But one of the things I found fascinating was what it does in my CSV. If I uh, just highlight this, this span is basically saying this is an aspect. If I look at what it's chosen as the aspects, it's chosen Ovi, who was a contestant, Anna, Curtis, Amber, um, Moira, Love Island. So it's so interesting that even just in my data, it's gone straight for choosing the contestants, which is exactly what I wanted in some senses. I want to know what it was, who, who in that sentence got positive and who got negative, because there's often multiple people mentioned in each sentence. And then this is what my opinion lexicon looks like, just to give you a very quick brief view. So all of the different kind of words, whether they're negative or whether they're positive. And so that was re-ranked when we train it. So loads of cool stuff happening there. Understanding this is quite, um, I went from sort of some more basic analysis. I looked at using um, pre-packaged AI and then I kind of moved off into the more bespoke AI. But just understanding that there is tools in the Azure platform for all of those different stages. And it's not even necessarily always an audience or a segment or a skill set split. I see it as actually a, I should always look to using things like cognitive services or things like automated machine learning before potentially diving in. But this felt like a good fit for the experiment that I was doing. So very, very quickly, just um, wrapping things up. What's next? Well, I have an idea. I need to firstly update my um, analytics, so include 2019. And then there was also a very brief series um, right at the end of last year, start of this year. Um, that I want to add in and just see whether the trends around the data analysis still apply. Um, I want to do more experimentation with data sets and parameters. Um, I want to try and set up a retraining pipeline so that if we do ever have a chance to see Love Island again, that actually I could just pass in that new data um, and get it to update my sort of uh, model and potentially try to try and start using it in real time. Um, and then I also want to review something called ML pipelines. This is a really great way to do um, like segment my code a bit more because there is a whole section of the training file and the pre-processing and um, where I'm getting my data set from and stuff like that. So these are all things where I'm trying to just refine my approach. So if you're interested, like reach out, let me know. Um, or if you have other ideas as well, like let me know that because I'm not, uh, I'm only kind of working on this myself. So finally, just super thank you. If there's anything that I can push, um, all of the uh, great information on the aspect-based sentiment analysis is available. Um, do take a look at that Ignite the Tour session that I built all of this off and just applied to my scenario. Um, I also wanted to then just say a big shout out to the Build AI solutions using Azure Machine Learning. If you want to learn more about Azure Machine Learning and you haven't really had a chance I highly recommend that Microsoft Learn course. It's a fantastic end to end. And I went in and kind of uh, did some of it. And even I learned different things and I use it on like quite a regular basis. So this is super interesting. And then for the community aspect, if you're looking to get more connected into the AI space, I highly recommend um, following the amazing global AI community as well as the Azure community. Um, so go to that link or also our team is putting together AI April, we've called it. So we're nearly at the end, but there's an amazing um, wealth of information, one post at least for every day of the week of April. Um, and you can find all of that at aka.ms AI April. So with that, I'll leave the, the uh, links up so people can keep a note of them. But um, yeah, that's kind of 
my little project and hopefully it's been a bit interesting on the Love Island side, a little bit technical to show you that there is a lot of technicality you can put into any data set and also um, some of the tooling used around Azure Machine Learning. Okay. Super. Th thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Amy. That was a, an amazing session. Really, really good. I didn't understand half of it. You know, my <laughs> my, my technical level isn't at your um, ninja skills for, for this, but it was really, really interesting.